Welcome to London Calling EU, a podcast from the EU delegation here in the UK, in which we look at this new post-Brexit relationship with a new lens and demonstrate that there is life beyond Brexit. Last week, we looked at education and how the Turing scheme, which replaced the EU's Erasmus scheme, works. Today, a short while after the end of the Crunch COP26 conference in Glasgow, we're going to look at climate change. But I want all of us here, every single one of you, to just for a minute think about one person in your life, one person only, that will still be around in 2030, and how that person will live if we do not stick to the 1.5 degrees here today. Don't kill this moment by asking for more text, different text, deleting this, deleting that. Everyone's been heard by the presidency over the last couple of months. A lot of respect to every single country in this room was given by the presidency over the last couple of months. And it is my firm belief that the text that is on the table now reflects perfectly well this respect shown. After years of preparation and weeks of negotiation culminating in Glasgow, we've just come to the end of COP26. And of course, there's still a long, long way to go before we can say we've dealt with climate change. But the great news is, together, the world has made some important breakthroughs. I apologise for the way this process has unfolded, um, and uh, I am deeply sorry. I also understand the, the deep disappointment, but I think, as you have noted, it's also vital that we um, protect this package. That was, of course, Boris Johnson speaking during the conference and before him, the EU Commissioner Franz Timmermans. And at the very end, we heard from the UK Cabinet Minister and President of COP26, Alok Sharma, sounding quite emotional. Certainly the language was stark, but it did show that when it comes to the big stuff, the EU and the UK can and will indeed work well together. Let's bring in our panel, Tom Burke from the Environmental Experts E3G. Tom used to advise the John Major government in the 1990s and even the mining giant Rio Tinto at one point. And Tom was in Glasgow for COP26. Michael Nicholson from the sustainability think tank, the Institute for European Environmental Policy, or IEEP. And finally, Jacob Worksman, who was the chief negotiator for the EU at COP26 in Glasgow. Let's start, Tom, if I may, with the overall takes from COP26. COP or flop? Oh, it certainly wasn't a flop. It did not get us to where we need to get to but it did take us a step forward into the really hard work of delivering on the Paris Agreement. So I think it took us somewhere. And it surprised people in a way by the way in which there was diverse response. It wasn't just governments doing things. It was also a whole range of other actors, business and the finance community in particular, who signed up to a whole series of side agreements that will drive forward investment in low carbon economy. So I think we saw quite a lot of positive signs, but none of it adds up to a solution to the problem. Okay, out of 10, Tom, what would you give it? A communique. I'd actually give it a, a five because what I think people fail to understand is just how difficult a task this is. Maybe I can calibrate that for this particular podcast. We're trying to get 200 nations to align their energy policies. That's what solving climate change involves. The EU has had a single market for nearly 50 years and has not managed to come up with a common energy policy because it's so politically difficult. So one shouldn't set wild expectations for what you're going to get out of an international agreement on a topic as difficult as this. Good point. Getting 200 countries to agree on anything is a big deal. Michael Nicholson from IEEP, COP or flop? Well, thank you, Joe. And uh, I must admit, I agree with many things that Tom said there. It, it hangs by a thread. Let's, let's be honest. Getting to 1.5, keeping that 1.5 degrees pledge alive was going to be tough. It was always going to be tough. Alex Sharma said, the pulse is weak. And I think that's a fair reflection of the situation. On the positive side, 
having fossil fuels mentioned in in the language is a really big thing. This is the first time ever where we're talking about fossil fuels in the mainstream debate now. It's not a question of whether we need to decarbonize our economies. It's a question of how and how fast. And I think that's a really big thing going forward. But ultimately, we haven't done enough yet. We're still got pledges that were announced during the COP that really only closed the emissions gap by 9%. The International Energy Agency and the Climate Action Tracker quite clearly said that pledges are insufficient. But Tom's right. I think that getting all the countries to agree was was always going to be a, a huge, huge battle. And a lot of countries around the world have very powerful domestic constituencies for the coal mining industries, which were, were always going to uh, make this a tricky issue. OK, we'll come back to coal in, in a moment. But first of all, let me ask Jacob Worksman, who is the chief advisor to DG Klima in the European Commission and the chief negotiator in Glasgow. Jacob, COP or flop? Oh, I would definitely say COP. It was not a flop. Glasgow delivered a lot. It didn't quite meet the very high standards that the UK COP presidency set for it in terms of demonstrating that we've kept 1.5 degrees within reach. Uh, if you look at the pledges that parties made in Glasgow, we didn't quite make it there. But it did keep the, the Paris process alive and in doing so, enables us to continue to reach towards that goal in the coming years. Now, when you say 1.5 degrees, that means limiting the rise in the Earth's temperature to 1.5 degrees over the next number of years. That's correct. And the way in which we formally measure that is by looking at these nationally determined contributions, the emissions reduction targets that most parties have set for themselves between now and 2030, and then assuming that they are implemented, model out what that means in terms of a trajectory towards limiting greenhouse gas emissions so that we keep that 1.5 degree temperature goal within reach so that we don't exceed that goal. What you can add on to that is a little bit less official, but it's the estimated impacts of reaching the net zero pledges that some parties have made on top of their 2030 targets. And then you can add on to that, if you'd like, the additional pledges that countries have made, for example, to phase out the internal combustion engine, to increase their share of renewables and their energy mix, to make greater investments in forests, to make sure that we're enhancing the nature-based contribution to reducing emissions. If you add all of that up together, you, you get a, a more optimistic picture of how far we have made in terms of the pledges that countries have made than simply looking at the 2030 targets. Michael, can I come back to you about something you said a little bit earlier about the coal industry and how politically charged that is? Were you surprised that India and China had the last minute change? And we're, we're arguing over a single word here, aren't we? Phasing out was uh, diluted to phasing down. Were you surprised at that? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And it's not just India and China. There are other countries around the world as well that rely on coal and trying to change their economies it is going to be tough. There are huge numbers of people who rely for their jobs and livelihoods on, on coal. And so we have to find a way to transition away from that. We have to do that, obviously, quite quickly. Uh, but there are people who need this in the short term. So it, it was not a surprise, no. Same question to you, Tom Burke from E3G. The Indians have been subsidising their fuel for many, many years, and it's politically fraught for them to stop subsidising fuel. So they wanted something else, and that was to phase down rather than phase out coal. Uh, I'm not sure I take that difference as being all that significant. I think Michael made the point earlier that really the signal that's come out is that coal is on its way out. And that's the important thing to focus on. That's true. It's not going to go out overnight. So I'm not surprised that we got the sort of reaction we got from India or from China. And they have got to deal with, as Michael also said, strong domestic constituencies. But the reality is that in India in particular, it's already cheaper to deploy solar, especially in the villages where people are remote from grid anyway, a lot of sun in India. So cheaper to do that now 
let alone in future as the cost of solar continues to fall. And it's going to be very hard to finance new coal. So the cost of new coal is going to go up simply because the markets have made up their mind already, I think, that coal is on its way out. So the risk of financing coal is greater. So we are going to see that transition take place. I think Michael made a very important point to bear in mind. You can't have a technology transition without a social transition. And we don't talk very much about the fact that there are going to be lots of jobs in a green economy, uh, but they're not going to be the same jobs for the same people in the same places with the same skills. And we hear less than we should about the need to accompany the energy transition with a social transition. Can I bring you in, Jacob Worksman, uh, the EU's chief negotiator? What was it like when these huddles got together, when we, we saw them on our screens of various different leaders and negotiators kind of literally doing a kind of a football or rugby-like huddle? What was that like? Well, I mean, what, what you were able to witness was the, the very, very last step in what was a two-and-a-half-week process that started with the leaders' summit at the outset of the COP and then ended with focusing on just a few words in what would become the, the kind of final cover decision of the COP. That kind of huddling was unique to that moment, but but prior to that, there were two weeks of intensive negotiations in which people were sitting around rooms and working through the more technical aspects of the text. But uh, that kind of huddling happens at the very end of, of a process like Glasgow when a final word choice has to be made. You know, it, it's great for the drama, but it's not actually what the negotiations look like on a day-to-day -day basis. So the final huddle is kind of like the dessert or the coffee or the cheese, but most of the, most of the meat and starters has been consumed. I guess that's a, a fair way of putting it, yeah. And, and what the huddle was about, which was this, this choice of words as to whether or not um, the Glasgow moment would involve a commitment to a, a phase out or a phase down of coal, was a bit of distraction from what the, the overall meeting was really about. At the end of the day, it was about getting NDCs strengthened, getting countries to commit to net zero targets by mid-century. And it was about um, delivering on the, the, the rule book that was essential for tracking countries' progress towards those pledges. That's essentially what Glasgow was about. Adding in that, that element of, uh, of a commitment to phasing out coal and a commitment to phasing out fossil fuel subsidies that you could say was kind of the, the cherry on the top. But because that became the issue over which ministers were disputing at the end, it, it, I think it distracted the media from what uh, the, the main deliverables of the conference were. Michael, can I bring you to a kind of a wider discussion about the societal change that Tom mentioned? Do you think that society is mentally prepared for the changes in their lifestyle and potentially in their spending that will be required to meet all the requirements of COP26? Well, it depends on who you ask from around the world. There will inevitably be some need for some reduction in consumption. And if we are to get to 1.5, we will need to have that as part of our conversation. It's not a very popular discussion and it's not yet in the mainstream part of, of the discussion and politicians will not want to talk about that, but it is important. Um, and that's reduction of aviation, of flights. It's also a reduction of, of consumption in, in our meat. When you say uh, cutting, are you talking about people flying less or paying more to fly? I think probably a bit of both there, but I think we should really consider this because we're not going to be able to get to these temperature limits without flying less. And then what we do fly, we're going to have to pay more for. So it's a bit of both. And I think the same goes for meat as well. Uh, we're going to have to uh, reduce that in order to ensure that we can continue with a very privileged um, life that, well, that, let, we, that we already have. Let me ask you, Michael, has anyone in your household had vegan burgers or vegan sausages yet? Yes, and, and my family and I made a commitment back in 2017, and, and we've actually reduced our meat consumption by about 90%, actually. Wow, that um, is, and that's spectacular. It, we, we have meat once a month or once every three weeks, and yes, 
it, it is a change. It is a change. And uh, I, I love a, a steak now and again. Uh, vegan sausages are not as good as the real thing, but uh, it is improving. And, and we, I think we just have to make a, a dedicated, deliberate shift uh, in order to, to meet our climate ambitions. I did a test with my two sons who are eight and nine years of age, and I literally blindfolded the two boys and put two different sandwiches in front of them, one with meat and one with vegan meat alternative. And the eight-year-old said he preferred the vegan one, blindfold, and I was delighted. Then they removed the things, and I said, okay, well, that one's actually vegan. And the moment I told him it was vegan, as in it was meat-free, he didn't want to touch it. What do you think, Tom? Have you changed your meat consumption? I have, but it wasn't anything much to do with climate change. That reason why I didn't do it, I did it just because it's just easier to cook. I mean, it was a lifestyle choice, but it wasn't driven by climate change. I'm, I'm a bit less interested in, than you in this, in the issue of what individual choices make. What people do matters. What they're willing to do will be driven by two things. One, it'll be driven by events. And that's why you've got such a high level of public anxiety around the world because it's quite clear that what's happening, actually happening in the climate, in people's lives, has now validated the science. So I think there's a sense in which the public expects governments to do something to address the problem in a way they haven't done before. And I think that pressure is going to go on for all the reasons we've discussed about we haven't done enough in Glasgow. So events are going to make a difference. And then secondly, what's going to make a difference is the quality of leadership. And what we saw really clearly out of COVID was the better the leaders behaved, the better the public behaved. And I think that will be equally true in relation to climate change. And so if leaders, political leaders, take on their responsibility as role models, I think it would be much easier for people to make those sort of changes in lifestyle that we need to make. Now, what will be made by who, where, was going to vary quite a lot, I think, as, as Michael said. But I don't have any doubt that if there's good political leadership, the combination of events and leadership will take us to where we need to be in terms of personal choice. Well, that brings us to the differences and the similarities between the UK and the EU when it comes to climate change. Does the UK and the EU have the right leadership? Tom? Uh, no, but for very different reasons. I think the UK has chosen to have particularly weak political leadership at the moment. There's very strong leadership in institutionally in all sorts of areas, but it does not have strong political leadership. The EU, in a sense, does not have strong political leadership because there isn't a single sort of focal point for a voice that leads Europe. So you get the Commission as it were, proposes, but it's not the political proposer. The politicians dispose, and we don't have a really strong political leadership. And that was very evident in Glasgow. You didn't really see the EU leaders stepping up in the same way visibly that you saw leaders from the other nations around the world. And I think that weakens the impact. Now, that's not to say that Europe isn't actually making an enormous difference. It really is, not the least because... With the largest single market, it's shaping the way in which other countries need to adapt their policies in order to accommodate those things that go on in Europe. But even so, we're not, as Europeans, we're not really giving voice to what I think actually is the authentic voice of the people of Europe. OK, well, let's put that to Jacob uh, Worksman, the chief negotiator from the EU. Supposedly, according to Tom, who was there, the EU didn't step up as much. And there is an issue of splintering, i.e. there's the Commission, the Council and the Parliament. And there's not exactly one clear voice. I'm sure you would disagree. Jacob. Well, I, honestly, I feel like I was at a different cop than, than Tom might have been at. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, he does acknowledge that the EU leads from, from the basis of example and experience. So all those policies that I have just mentioned are what enable the EU to enter into a negotiation like that and not just say that we want parties to develop targets that are in line with the Paris goals, like 1.5 and not just say that we want other parties to reach net zero by mid-century, but actually show that we've made that commitment ourselves 
In fact, we, we've made it as part of our binding legislation within the EU, which I think is distinct from many other parties. So we, we do lead by example. We do, in, in my perspective, lead with one voice. All, all the 27 member states, whether they were speaking at, at leaders level or ministerial level, were sending that same message. And we, we also have my boss, the executive vice president, Timmermans, speaking on behalf of the European Green Deal. And, and when he does so, he doesn't do so just as a diplomat calling on other parties to act, but he does it as a policymaker who is someone who is responsible within the EU for actually designing and implementing the policies that will deliver on our targets. So uh, I think r rather than the voice of a mere diplomat, he, he speaks both as a diplomat and as a policymaker. And I think both in a bilateral context, but also from the floor of the plenary, he spoke very loudly and very powerfully and with a great deal of credibility and legitimacy. So, I mean, I understand when others sort of see someone like Secretary Kerry taking the global stage with a, an, an element of, of, of star power, um, mm -hmm. that we might be able to attract more attention, more media. But we're still waiting to see whether or not the U.S., frankly, is going to be able to deliver on its targets. Everyone's watching Congress very carefully. And, and I think that the, the difference between that kind of leadership and the E leadership is that we, we do speak with, with credibility and legitimacy and through the voice of someone who is responsible both for, as our chief negotiator, the international diplomacy, as well as the domestic implementation. Uh, that's one of the differences between the EU and the US. The EU don't sit down at the negotiating table until they have a mandate from all 27 member states at leader level, whereas the Americans, the White House does the negotiating and then hopes to get it through Congress, whereas that is less of an issue on the European side because they've already squared it in advance. Now, let's go back to Michael on that issue of the similarities and the divergences between the UK and the EU. Where do you think there are divergences when it comes to climate change, climate change only? Where are the divergences and where do you think are the strong overlaps or areas of cooperation? The UK and the EU are still intertwined in so many ways. And there are increasingly going to be divergences. It's been a, a very clear message from the UK government. It may differ according to each individual nation of the United Kingdom, but I think that there will be increasingly differences in how we regulate agriculture, for example, for example, how we deal with farm payments and things like that. You said the type of crops and all that. So did you mean that the UK will start allowing GM or genetically modified food and the EU will not? It, it's uh, a very political uh, discussion, that. OK. All right. I, I, I interrupted you. You were mid-flow about the divergences and the areas of similarity between the two unions. On broad terms, we're going to stay fairly similar. There will be divergences on individual policies, but I think in terms of the climate issue, with both the UK and the European Union have got very ambitious targets. Is it enough? Perhaps not yet, but we are in this part of the world at least leading the way. And um, the UK's target is is very similar to the to the EU's. Tom, you talked about leadership being a major issue. Let's talk about the overlaps. Let's talk with the positive overlaps. Where do the EU and UK stand that they agree on, that they will continue to agree on in the, over the next decade or so? Well, one of the most important things that came really clear at COP was that the financial community is going to play a very large part in shifting the trillions into low-carbon energy, the private sector, as it were. It's going to need the public sector to provide the right sort of framework, but a lot of the actual money that needs to be spent to make the difference is kind of, and in that case, the EU and, and, and Britain are completely closely aligned in, in that respect. Where that rubber is going to hit the road on that is on the issue of the taxonomy, which is a classification process by which you decide what a green investment is and, and is not. And that's a major tool, in fact, that Europe is developing that will shape not just policy in Europe, but also around the world as markets respond to that pressure to invest in, in low carbon. And in that case, it's divisions inside the EU that are going to be very crucial. 
Because um, the French, the French want to include nuclear power in the taxonomy of the green environment, and other countries are not so keen. Well, the French want to include it, and the Germans don't. The real point about this is the taxonomy to have the effect it's going to have on private investment needs to be science based. And if it looks like politics is intervening, it's not just on nuclear; it's also on gas. If the EU is prepared to deform the taxonomy's science base in order to accommodate particular countries, then it weakens the whole significant impact of the taxonomy on driving private investment, not just in Europe and Britain, but also around the world. And staying with the divergences, will the taxonomy in the UK include nuclear, do you think? And what will it include and what will it exclude? Oh, I certainly think it's the ambition of the current government that it should include nuclear that to some extent will be shaped a little bit by what how the debate in Europe is resolved the fact of the matter is that you can't build enough nuclear power stations to make any difference on climate change anyway so it's a huge distraction not just in terms of how it might corrupt the whole idea of the taxonomy but indeed how it would divert very large amounts of public money as well as private money into doing something that can't help very much. Jacob, can I bring you in here, please, on the taxonomy issue? For example, who will prevail in this discussion about whether nuclear should be included or not? So this taxonomy that the EU has been developing is really, it's a, a, a method for helping consumers and investors to understand the, the nature of the activities that the companies that they're investing in uh, are undertaking and the extent to which they are green or brown. The first edition of the taxonomy focuses on the, the climate impacts of those activities. So in that context, uh, a technology such as nuclear energy would rate quite green because obviously it's, it's not involved in emitting significant amounts of greenhouse gases. But further developments within that taxonomy might take into account consumer concerns about other aspects of nuclear energy, including the fact that uh, we still have a big challenge in dealing with uh, the waste from uh, nuclear production. The Commission's stance on the role of nuclear power in our green energy transition and our low carbon transition is technology neutral. And that's partly because we're, our primary drive is on reducing emissions. And it's partly because our member states have very different views about um, the, the role that they want to see nuclear energy playing in, in their energy mixes. E.g. France and, of course, Poland has a massive coal industry, which is very keen to hang on to. By the way, how are the Poles going to manage the phasing out or phasing down of coal? Well, one of the most interesting developments that we saw in Glasgow was Poland actually signing up to something called the Powering Past Coal Initiative. So independently of the EU as a whole, but uh, together with other member states, they've actually made a commitment to phase out coal from their energy mix through one of many initiatives that were launched or, or strengthened in Glasgow. So that was very interesting to see. I think it's because they, they've made essentially that decision themselves that the future for Poland is not in coal. What they're concerned about, as we are, is to make sure that as we transition out of coal, that we are taking care of those communities that have become dependent upon that as an industry and as a, a source of income. So I think as long as, as the EU helps Poland in that transition and Poland helps its citizens with that transition, Poland is actually um, well prepared to, to, to do that. What many people don't recognize is that while Poland continues to be dependent upon coal, much of the coal that it's burning at the moment is not coming from Poland but from less expensive uh, sources of, of, of coal from outside of Poland. The markets alone aren't delivering the, uh, the support to, to Polish coal miners, even as Poland continues to burn coal for its energy. Tom, you, you've spoken about taxonomy, which is very useful, leadership, which is very useful, how you consider what is a green investment, what is not. Do you think the fact that there are 27 different member states on the EU side, that's going to dilute proper, proper progress, so it'll only mean that low-hanging fruit can be dealt with on an EU level? I don't think that, actually. I think the EU as an institution has shown an ability, even if it sometimes takes a frustratingly long time, to get to where it sets out to get to. And I think this policy is broadly supported across Europe by the public not always by governments, but certainly by the public. What I think important to bear in mind is the consequences of climate policy failure will be very bad for the EU. 
basically, if climate policy fails, you're going to be looking at southern Europe being exposed to impacts from a climate policy that people in northern Europe are not exposed to. And that's going to really put pressure on the unity of the European Union. So there's a real incentive at a very high political level for Europe to hang together and solve the problem together. Climate policy failure doesn't only mean that you won't have anybody very much from northern Europe wanting to holiday in southern Europe in a period of 50 degree temperatures. It also means southern Europe will be exposed to very massive influxes of migrants from other parts of North Africa and the Middle East. And that will enormously create real problems. So we have to, in a sense, if get the political lead from Europe about how important policy success is to keeping the EU together as an integrated whole. Michael, can I come back to you and ask you about carbon border adjustment taxes? That is an issue that has been raised and the EU are thinking seriously about it. It's not necessarily confirmed yet. Is that something that the UK could consider joining in as well? As I understand it, the carbon border adjustment mechanism is being discussed here in the UK as well. I'm thinking of of developing one here in the UK. There are a lot of positives to this, but obviously we have to be cautious about the the negative effects that that might have on uh, industries in the global south and in, in, in developing countries. Carl, do you want to get in on that? Yeah, I do. I really think uh, these border adjustment mechanisms are a triumph of theory over experience. I don't think they're going to add anything. And actually, that's a, a problem the Commission tends to suffer from. The idea of extending the ETS to cover buildings and movement strikes me as an equally bad idea because, again, a triumph of theory over experience. The fact of the matter is that we don't have global trade in a lot of things that you'd want to apply these adjustments to, steel possibly. There isn't a global trade in concrete, so why would you do that? It's not a global trade. seems to me there's a real set of of opportunism going in here for people to try and impose things that may sound popular because they appear to punish bad behaviour, but actually would be very counterproductive. I think there's quite a debate going to go on over CBAMs. And, and actually, Joe, if I may just sure. come in on, on that as well, there's um, not enough evidence yet in this whole area, as, as I think uh, we were just hearing. And I think also it, it does send out bad signals and we've got to be careful about how countries like China and, and India will, will react to these things. So we ought to be very clear about what it's for and how it's going to work before we go any further down this line. Yes, and I'll put that to Jacob Worksman from DG Klima. Could there be major problems between the UK and the EU if Brussels decides to introduce a carbon border adjustment mechanism or charging countries based on how much carbon was used in the manufacture or even transportation of goods into the European Union? Well, I mean, I think our our initial analysis of which countries would be affected by the carbon border adjustment mechanism as proposed doesn't suggest that the UK would be particularly hard hit by that. I think what we're waiting to see is how many other economies that are as committed to reducing their emissions as the EU is and are as concerned about the potential for carbon leakage as a result of our taking the lead to address climate change might also have to consider the use of mechanisms such as the CBAM. So we're expecting that within a short period of time, the UK also will be thinking about how to do border adjustments when it's trading with partners that don't have as ambitious policies as, uh, as the UK has. It's kind of a shared challenge. Every country that takes climate change seriously will eventually have to address the issue of carbon leakage and think about what policies are the most cost effective in, in order to address them. Final thoughts, I'll stay with you, Jacob, uh, about the the overall cooperation between the UK and the EU uh, when it comes to climate change. How would you assess it? Well, I I, I would characterize it as very, very strong. I mean, as as we just talked about, we have very similar commitments to ambition and commitments to implementing that ambition at the EU level, at the UK level. And in, in the course of the negotiations in Glasgow, we worked very closely with the UK COP presidency at the, at the technical level and at the ministerial level as well. 
I think there will always be some rivalry uh, between the UK and the EU, rivalry for, for leadership on various issues. Certainly, the EU is profiling itself as a leader on climate change. The UK is profiling itself as a leader on climate change, and hopefully we can lead together uh, on this issue um, rather than making it a, a point of controversy or, or conflict. Tom, overall, how would you assess the EU-UK relationship when it comes to dealing with climate change? I think on the whole, it's it's been workmanlike. It's not been subject to the kind of tensions that there have been elsewhere in the relationship between the EU and the UK. I think the real big advantage is in getting interconnectors, in making a, as it were, pan-European electricity and grid work, because that has advantages for the UK and for the EU to make that. And that means aligning the regulation uh, as well as the investment so that you can uh, have a very effective low carbon electricity supply that's very much more secure and reliable than it would be for either without that alignment. Michael Nicholson from the IEEP, final word on this. I agree fully. I think there are some positive messages coming out from both sides on the issue of adaptation as well. I think the the case that came out uh, during COP on supporting South Africa to decarbonise and reduce its coal use, this was an initiative that the EU and the UK worked together on. The methane pledge, for example, that came out of COP, although that was an EU-US initiative, the UK was, was there ready to sign up to that as well. These are really positive things. And I think the EU and the UK are very similarly aligned on much of the climate issues thanks very much and that brings to a close our podcast thanks to all my guests you've just heard from michael nicholson from the ieep from jacob worksman who is the chief negotiator for the eu at cop 26 and is the chief advisor to gg clima in the commission and from tom burke from e3g stay tuned for our next podcast and don't forget to subscribe to london calling eu wherever you get all your podcasts. From me, Joe Lynham, ciao for now.